Hello, and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Last week, we were looking at this Invis Spectrum Plus, a clone of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus. We got it working without much problem, but we encountered this green screen. I tried a couple of things just to see if there was something obvious, but I just could not get rid of that tint. It actually even crossed my mind that maybe this particular clone had that green tint to it, but oh no, as soon as I published the video, people were telling me loud and clear that their model displayed colors beautifully. And so it's back to the drawing board for us. And today we're going to figure out why we're getting that green tint. In order to track this, we need to understand all the parts in the system that are involved creating the color signal. This is a very rough block diagram of those parts. It starts on the left with the oscillator that generates a master clock that gets sent to the ULA. The ULA generates a color clock and the RGB signal, which gets sent to the MC1377P, which is a PAL encoding chip that creates a composite video signal, which then in turn gets sent to the RF modulator, and that's what we send to our TV. It's actually not that simple because each of those signals usually has some processing that happens in between. Last time we ruled out the MC1377P from being potentially faulty because I swapped it with one from a Sinclair QL and that worked. And we also ruled out the RF modulator because I did a quick check and displayed the composite video directly on the TV. So right now let's start with the oscillator and the master clock. We should see like 17, Let's see, 17.734 megahertz. That's perfect. The signal looks good, but it seems pretty well formed for being right at the crystal oscillator. Now, this gets sort of improved, the, uh, the signal, and eventually gets fed into the ULA slash gate array in pin 27. It's now the prettiest square wave, but that's probably good enough. The little ripples, I don't think they're affecting anything. It goes all the way to two volts. And again, we have a steady 17.73 megahertz. So that looks good. From here, the gate array produces the clock signal, which we're not really that concerned about. I mean, it seems to be working. Um, might as well check it. So that's 29, so two pins over. Okay, that one looks really square, really nice, a little noisy, but that's totally fine. And it's 3.54 megahertz, almost 3.55. And that's what the, um, what the Invest Spectrum has a slightly higher clock rate than a regular ZX Spectrum, as we'll see later. So that's exactly what we're expecting. So this is pin 29. And then the more interesting one is in pin 31, we have the color clock signal. So this is the signal for encoding the PAL color in the composite signal. And it should be a 4.43 megahertz. So again, that's looking good. And the signal looks very nice and square. So at least just visually, that seems fine. I suppose it could be up or down just a tiny bit. And maybe that's affecting things enough so that the colors are displayed a little wrong and we just don't see it in the oscilloscope. It's, it's possible, but I'm certainly not seeing anything really wrong with that. Okay, we can check the oscillator and the master clock as all good, or can we? We actually can't. All we did was check and make sure that they seem reasonable, but it's not like I changed the quartz crystal or did any serious checks on it. So we're just going to put it as probably okay in that yellowish color. Now let's move on to testing the RGB signals that come straight out of the ULA. In the startup screen, it's this gray, so we should be seeing ideally the same level in R, G, and B, since those are the outputs of the gate array. Okay, uh, looks pretty steady, goes all the way to five volts, pretty much. The flashing, when we get that, that's probably the letters at the bottom of the screen and the retrace, but yeah, that, that looks totally fine. Now G, so green is 21 and it looks identical. So it's not any higher. These are, I think, TTL, so these are digital. It's just saying whether it's present or not, it's not an analog output. And then red is the same. So those RGB values look totally reasonable. We can mark the RGB signals as checked, but again, we don't know for sure that they're working correctly. 
However, there is one test we can do that would let us know for sure if the RGB signals are correct. Since this outputs RGB signals, we can create a board that lets us hook up those signals to the TV directly in RGB mode. And there we'll see the colors that we're getting independently of the clock frequency and the poly encoding and all of that. So that doesn't sound too easy because the computer doesn't have any kind of RGB out, but it's very similar to the Spanish 128K toast rack in Vistronica computer. Uh, it also outputs RGB signals. And I happen to already have a cable for that. So we pretty much just have to take the signals from here, R R G and B, along with vertical sync and ground, I believe those are the only five signals that we need. We need to put a couple resistances to match the same circuit as the 128K computer, and then hook that up to this connector. And then that goes into our cable that we already have. We start by tuning the connector to make the soldering as easy as possible later on. And now we can solder them. The thing to keep in place is that the schematic shows the connector from the front view. They say that in big letters because it's very common to mistake that. So we're doing it from the solder point of view. So we need to flip things. This is not intended to be a permanent connection at all, but still it would be nice to protect the um, cables from accidentally touching against each other. I mean, they're, they're pretty stiff, so I don't think they will, but I'm just going to slide in these like shrink tubing and we can even use some hot air to make sure that it stays in place. And now we add some small resistances to match the 128K circuit. Now I'll connect those cables to the board and they're mostly color matched except for this annoying yellow whites, but it didn't have any white um, pins like that. That's right, we'll just follow the color of the cable itself. Okay, let's try this on the CRT TV. Hmm, that's not what I was hoping for. I think I did something wrong. Right, I just learned something new. The RGB signal on a SCART connector doesn't use the sync signal for the composite video. It actually uses the composite video itself to generate a syncing pattern. So we actually need to connect the composite video to our cable in order to get correct syncing. And we hook it up over here in pin nine of the MC1377P, which is where the composite video is generated. And now we test it again and perfect. It's a little dark, but that looks great. And there's definitely no green tint in there. So now we know for sure that there's no problem with the RGB and bright signals out of the ULA. It has to be something else. I think the next best thing is to check the color clock and how it changes from the ULA on its way to the PAL encoder. Unfortunately, the circuit that modifies the color clock coming out of the ULA into a signal that is used in the PAL encoder is not something that we have any information of. So I actually traced this on the board myself and I came up with roughly this circuit. At the source coming out of the ULA, the color clock is a perfect square signal. Then that gets passed through that inductor and Q6, the transistor, and it gets transformed into more or less of a sine wave or a triangle wave, depending on how you look at it. Then it gets biased through a couple of capacitors, and then it gets fed into the PAL encoder on pin 17. Everything in the oscilloscope looked reasonable. Maybe that signal is a little noisy, but any of these capacitors, if they were to fail, they could cause the problems that we're seeing. So I decided to start by replacing capacitor 38 because that was the most likely candidate to cause these kind of problems. Oh, oh, wow. Capacitor, it was, it just, this piece just came off without any resistance whatsoever. So I suspect this was broken and just in place somehow. Well, if that's the case, that could definitely be the cause of our problems. So let's definitely replace this one.
Unfortunately, after testing it, the screen was just as green as before. Looking at the data sheet of the 1377P, capacitor 28 also looked like a definite possibility. So I went to try it, not expecting much because it was kind of a shot in the dark and yeah, it's still green. I had read in multiple places how other users had color problems that were solved by replacing this capacitor or that other capacitor, all related to the PAL encoding chip or the clock generation. I hate changing capacitors or any piece for that matter without evidence that there's something wrong with it. So instead of just continuing trying different things, I'm just going to shelf this as probably okay and move on to something else. So earlier when I drew those RGB signals going from the ULA to the PAL encoder and said they were fine, I kind of lied. The ULA generates digital signals, but then they get combined with the bright signal and converted into analog signals that get fed into the PAL encoder. So we know they're fine at the output of the ULA, but is the signal getting to the PAL encoder correct? Let's find out. So let's look at R, which is pin 42 on the ULA. And okay, yeah, that's the single one. So that's pretty much what we expect. Nothing during the horizontal retrace and then full on um, for red during the line because we're seeing a, gr a gray screen. So that red signal is the same as the one here. So it goes to this resistor and it goes through a voltage divider pretty much. So there we have the same thing, but much smaller. So now the amplitude, it's about half a volt. So we can crank it up, so it's really noisy. Right, this gets combined with the bright line over here with those resistors and those diodes, but there's nothing there right now. And then it simply gets fed through this capacitor. And then over here, and to change the scale, right? Because internally the MC1377P is, I'm guessing is biasing that signal up. So it's almost four volts. So that seems totally reasonable. Now let's compare the values of the R and G signals. Okay, so I've hooked up the um, oscilloscope directly to the red channel. This is the yellow trace that we see here. And this is before the last capacitor going into the PAL encoder. So that's what we saw just a second ago. Now I'm gonna turn on the second channel, which is tied to the green color channel. And what we see is that they're pretty much identical. I've moved them both down minus four divisions just to see them in the screen while we're at 200 millivolts scale. And yeah, capturing a single sequence, they look identical to me. I can even zoom way in. Yep, that looks good. And if I moved the red one to the blue channel, we have exactly the same thing. Okay, now I'm going to capture this at the other end of the capacitor. So this is at the input of the PAL encoder. There you go. It looks about the same. Actually, that doesn't look exactly the same. The yellow component, so the red component, is definitely a little less, it's a little lower than the other one. Yeah, so more zoomed in, we're seeing even more evidence of that. Clearly, the red channel, which is the yellow here, is lower. By how much? I mean, not by much, right? This is 500 millivolts, so that's what? A, a tenth of that? Now we're talking about an amplitude of only about one volt, so I mean, that, might be, that might be what we're seeing. So I'm going to change the red channel to the blue channel just to check. Now set to blue, and yeah, here they're both the same. So maybe what we were seeing is not so much of a green tint, 
but a lack of red and it was really a green blue tint. Where is this bias coming from? Because, well, the bias is coming from inside of the PAL encoder, but we've already determined that that's probably not it because I swapped it with the QL and that was fine. So maybe there is something else around the PAL encoder, some of those capacitors that I was looking at earlier, maybe they are changing the bias somehow. So as a test, I've removed the capacitors from the PAL encoder chip, and I've hooked up the probes directly to the R and G pins. And what we see in the oscilloscope is just the internal bias of those two um, pins. And again, we see that the green one is slightly higher than the red one. And I'm thinking that's that's what we're seeing. That's the that lower red uh, channel voltage. It's making the, the screen have that tint. The question is, why is that happening? I mean, maybe we have two faulty MC1377P chips. That would be weird. I actually have another Sinclair Spectrum QL, which if I'm going crazy with this, I might pull it out and try the third chip just to be sure. But I'm inclined to think that there's something else in the way this is configured. Some of those capacitors are affecting that bias for that channel. To make a long story short, I decided to pull out the PAL encoding chip and just test it in isolation. I didn't hook it up to anything, just power, ground, and I look at the bias at R, G, and B. And lo and behold, it was exactly the same. Red was a little lower than green and blue. So I pulled out the other PAL encoder from the Sinclair QL and it was the same. So I'm gonna guess that all of this was a false lead and I'm gonna guess that red is just biased differently because of how it is implemented internally. So we'll mark the RGB signals temporarily as probably okay. So at this point, I'm quickly running out of ideas. It seems like we're trying everything and making no progress whatsoever. So I'm reading the data sheet of the MC1377P over and over, which by the way, it's a fantastic data sheet. It has so much information, including how it's implemented internally, how they recommend using that chip. It's an example of what data sheets should be like for ICs of this type. Anyway, looking at it, I see that there is one potential area that if it failed, it could be causing something like this. And that's a simple RC circuit fed by the internal voltage regulator, that 8.2 volt or something, that it gets fed into pin one and is used as a, as a voltage ramp. So when it reaches a certain point, it triggers the generation of the color burst. If that capacitor in that RC circuit was off somehow, it could be causing the problems that we're seeing. The tricky thing about this is that this is not just any old capacitor. Uh, it says 102, so that's so it's one nanofarad, but I can't just substitute it with any old one nanofarad, one nanofarad capacitor because this is actually a mica capacitor, which makes it a very um, low tolerance um, capacitor, so it's very accurate. And so I can't just change it with any other one of the same rating. It needs to be exactly that kind. I don't have any in my spare toolkit, but the QL, since it has the same PAL encoding chip, has the same capacitor. So I'm going to try taking it out of the QL and putting it here and see if that makes a difference. So this is the QL and this is the MICA capacitor. As you can see, it even looks pretty different from other capacitors. And no, don't worry, I'm not planning on using the QL just for parts. The idea is to repair it later on. But for now, I just want to test it because those capacitors are not really easy to come by. So if this works, then I'll go ahead and order one to replace it. And in what's becoming a pattern by now, nothing changed again. So we still have a greenish screen. So we'll have to extend our diagram to show some of the circuitry around the PAL encoder and then mark it temporarily as it seems okay. In addition, I just realized that we implicitly tested the composite video circuit between the PAL encoder and the RF modulator because we saw that the composite video at the RF modulator looked okay last time. So I'm also going to mark that one as checked. At this point, I'm afraid that we may not be able to fix this. It seems that we checked everything. I honestly was almost ready to give up, but I just had an idea that might help us determine if some of the parts that we marked probably okay, really were okay or not, which is to move over the MC1733P onto a breadboard and connect it 
with cables to where it came from. So, so far is the same thing as having it here. But I have not connected pins 17 and 18. Those carry the color clock signal that we've traced earlier that comes gener generated by the ULA and it gets modified in a few places. To really eliminate the clock signal as a possibility, I can generate it myself and skip that completely. You can give it an already generated uh, signal for the color subcarrier, or you can set up a, um, an oscillator, where, and even shows you how to set it up with a couple of um, capacitors and um, the 4.43 megahertz oscillator, and feed that in pins 17 and 18. So that's exactly what I've done. So let's fire this up. And what we're gonna see if, if it's still green, then we know for sure it's nothing, it's not anything to do with the clock generation of the color signal. If the green is fixed, then there was something going on in there and we can look in more detail at replacing some of the capacitors and inductors and transistors along the way. So let's give it a try. Let's plug it in. And it's still very much green <laughs> with an added interference. Now that I'm not too surprised about because I guess the cables probably add some kind of interference with each other. So at least we can for sure mark the color clock as definitely okay. And that actually helps quite a bit. So the only other things that could be going wrong are the RGB signals themselves or some of the other auxiliary circuitry on the board. There's another test we can do on this board to know which of the two things it is. So we could swap the R and G lines and see if there's a change of tint. If there's a change of tint, the problem then is on the RGB signals, even though we looked at them in the oscilloscope earlier and they looked identical. It's a very easy change. R, G, and B are pins three, four, and five. So all we have to do is move that cable to four and move that cable to three and fire it up. So let's do that. That's it, and that's the whole change. So once again, let's connect it. And it's still green. Okay, that's very useful. So that means it's definitely not the RGB signal. We had already kind of decided that. So it's something else, either in the encoder itself, and I'm actually starting to wonder if it has, if it's the modulator again. That would be horrible if that was the modulator that supposedly we tested, we, we did the quick composite mod. Maybe I should do a full composite mod, mod in here so we can really appreciate, was it really green? Okay, so I've set up a very simple composite video mod right here. We're taking the composite signal directly from the input to the RF modulator, going through a capacitor and then straight into the RC jack. So there really, there isn't much to it. This is exactly like the one I showed you a few videos ago that you can do in any ZX spectrum. Okay, let's connect it once again. And this is more or less what we saw last time, but now I'm not totally convinced that this is green. I mean, it looks a little green, but it could just be that it's dark. Um, I've also read that this composite mod on this particular board produces particularly dark signal. So there is a better composite mod that we can do using a transistor to boost the signal. We've done all this, so we might as well go ahead and try that with a transistor to get a brighter signal. And then we'll see for sure if we're getting a you know, greenish, bluish tint or not. And this is the whole composite mod. So normally we would have the video signal, which is the composite video signal coming here, going through the capacitor and off to the connector. Instead, we have the video signal going into the base of the transistor. And then on the emitter, we have five volts. And then on the collector, we have a small resistance going to ground and the connection, in this case, through a capacitor to the, um, to the connector. The capacitor is really even optional. It's the transistor that enhances and boosts the um, strength of the signal. So let's try it with a transistor mod and, oh, wow. That looks a lot better than it did before. I'm pretty sure the green tint is gone. Let's try it on the CRT to be sure. And yeah, that was it. This looks perfectly clear gray the way it should be without any weird tint to it. So it was the RF modulator after all. 
Wow, and we spent all this time going around and around, and it was something that we had assumed from the beginning that it was working. Ouch. All right, well, we might as well make the composite mod permanent. I was hoping to leave it the same as it came, so the options are to replace the RF modulator, and I have other ones, but if I'm gonna do that work, we might as well put composite mod because most people will prefer that probably, and then we see that it gives us much better results. So I'm still gonna do the non-destructive one, so the one that you can reverse it easily as opposed to emptying the RF modulator. And yep, yeah, there you go. Beautiful color. I'd never think I'd say that about a boring gray. Wow, that was way harder than I expected, but at least we managed to fix it. It's frustrating that it was something that we decided weeks ago that it was working, but there are some interesting lessons to be learned here. First of all, not to give up. With this kind of technology that we're talking about, it's almost always possible to figure out what's going on. Another lesson is to recheck your assumptions periodically. I'm glad I checked the RF modulator finally, but maybe I should have done that earlier and saved some time. And finally, is that even if you're checking everything and not finding a fault, it's actually really interesting to keep digging deeper and learning more details about how a machine is put together, especially for a computer like this, that there's almost no information out there and we had to reverse engineer it as we went. Of course, I wasn't able to finish everything, so we'll wrap things up in part three. I hope you enjoyed that video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.